Hello and welcome. My name is Evelyn Knight and I am the child care business coach. I am doing this recording as a dual purpose for my podcast and my Facebook group. So welcome, whichever you're listening, if you're listening to the podcast, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in every Monday at the 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for our live presentation. I'm here with Future Kane. We're going to be talking today about social emotional literacy for early uh, child care leaders and how we can really bring that into our centers as leaders and how we can incorporate that into diversity and equity. So let me tell you a little bit about Future. Future uh, has spent her career in education and is a certified yoga instructor. She specializes in social emotional learning uh, to enhance the education, health, and business and in the schools. So she is currently the director of SEL and community outreach reach at Brown Deer Middle High School and has developed and implemented a district-wide SEL education strategic plan. So she has also created and led adult SEL professional development training for 140 staff members. Um, so she has a lot of great experience and she is sharing it with us here. So I really, really appreciate that you're here doing this with me today, Future. Thank you so much. And by the way, at the end, I will be um, adding Future's contact information in the show notes. And as you jump on, make sure to let us know you're here. You can ask questions and just participate. We, I love to see the participation. It's nice to get the questions and just comments are always great. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Future, if you want to take over our screen. All right. Thanks so much, Evelyn. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody. I am excited to be here with you on this beautiful morning or afternoon. So the title of this series is What the Hell is SEL? And if, for those of you who don't know what SEL stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Social and Emotional Learning. However, we wanted you to understand the literacy behind all of it and everything that goes into each component. And throughout this series of this month, we will be deep diving into each of the competencies. So you could see the competencies that are up on here. And I will go into more detail, but I wanted everybody to get a feel for what they are. So we always start with the self-awareness and then we usually go to self-management and then the responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and it all ties together in the social awareness. So the order for the day, in case you wanted to know or in case you missed something and have to step away is we are first gonna define SEL and equity. And then we'll be moving through each of the five competencies. After that, it's gonna be important for Evelyn and I just to have a discussion on how this is important to the current times. We're living in the middle of a pandemic as we speak in addition to civil and racial unrest. We then will be talking about who is it important for, because I get that question oftentimes, and how can it help adults, parents, students, children. Overall, the definition of social emotional learning is the way that both students and adults learn and practice their attitudes and skills necessary for life. So for example, it is the way in which people understand and manage their own emotions, it's the way that we set and achieve positive goals, that we feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. I would like to look at SEL as a universal approach. And so in other words, what does that mean? It's for all students and it's for all adults. Anyone who has social and emotional needs, which is every one of us, and concerns and skills, it's important to remember that SEL is a process of developing our own competencies in life. So CASEL, which is the framework that our school district has chosen to adopt, and they've been in 
business probably for over 20 years, and there's been a lot of research that has gone into it. They recently, with everything that's going on, changed their SEL definition to more of a transformational SEL. And I put the definition up on here because it's important because what they had left out was the co-learning. And as anybody knows, if you're in the childcare, if you're a parent listening, if you're an educational leader, it's not in the classroom where we as the educators are just providing knowledge to those students. We are also learning from those students. So that's why they changed the definition to state it's a process by which young people and adults build strong and respectful lasting relationships that facilitate co-learning, which is the key word, through critical examination of root causes of inequities, the development of collaborative solutions to personal community and societal problems. I think it's important to talk about this, and I don't know how many people have seen Maslow's hierarchy, but you can Google it. Um, and Maslow's hierarchy states that if a child or an adult for that matter, if basic needs, which are food, water, warmth, and rest aren't met, then it's gonna be hard for us then to reach any of the other items on this graph. So if you don't have the basic needs, it's gonna be very difficult for you to feel, feel secure and feel safe wherever you're at. And then you move to the belonging and love. If you don't have all the two things below, you're not really focused on making intimate relationships or friends because you're so worried about when is my next meal coming or I don't feel safe, whether it's in the place that I'm at currently or feel safe in my own home. And then that's at the point when you build upon all those, we could start chopping away at the psychological needs, which is not the only the belonging and feeling loved, but it's the prestigious feeling of your accomplishment, your own self-esteem and your self-efficacy in life. And the highest point, which some people I would say probably don't even meet in their lifetime on earth is the self-fulfillment needs of their self-actualization, which is achieving one's full potential. So I have so many different conversations with people to say, what is my purpose in life? And there's often people that are searching for that. And whether they feel that they have a purpose, but due to other circumstances, they can't live out those. So that's why I say oftentimes how many people are really living um, to the fullest and have all those other needs. I guess the other thing that I've been looking at recently is there was a study that was conducted on daycares. And they said that when the week of March 2nd, and I think the week of the 2nd and the 7th, around those times, which was right before the pandemic hit, that daycares were pretty much at 100% attendance rate. And then you saw the pandemic hit and you saw it drastically decrease for whatever reasons, whether daycares had closed or whether parents had opted to take their children out because they didn't feel safe or maybe because they couldn't afford because they lost their jobs. And now we're on an uptick back to being full capacity. But even with that, I want everybody to question the full capacity, if you look at the chart from many different states, they did it um, across every single state in the United States. There are some daycares that are at 14% where they were before. And then there are some that have made it all the way up to, I think it was 80% back to their normal attendance. So that's why I think Evelyn and I said, okay, this is now more important than ever because we're gonna have kids that are coming back that aren't, it's been proven obviously, you're not at full capacity at this point, but then I'm gonna question and push you to think, what are you going to do with the daycares to revamp and have a, a new you? Did you have a question, Evelyn? No, I was going to actually interject there because I think you bring up a great point in that right now, I know for my daycare, my child care center, I'm at about 80% from mm -hmm. where I was before all this happened. And at one point I had actually gone down to about 30%. Mm -hmm. And so I think now is a wonderful opportunity to just embrace change and just to revamp our policies, procedures, and how we do things all together. It just taking advantage of that opportunity right now is prime. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here. Um, so one of the competencies and the first that I like to start with, because you have to, in my opinion, you have to start with self-awareness in order to move forward on anything else. 
So self-awareness is essentially the ability to accurately recognize your own emotions and your thoughts and their influence then on your behavior and how you're reacting or how you're acting in certain situations and with certain people and at certain times. This also includes accurately assessing your own strengths and the challenges that you face, whether it's in certain situations, whether it's now that you've transformed your life to working at home and you're also an educator of your own kids, and that's possessing a well-grounded sense of your own confidence and your own optimism, especially during this time. So I put other examples down there too, because I think it's important. So I question people to just sit and with their emotions and I do quotes. I try to put quotes out once a week just to inspire. And that started when COVID hit, inspire people, whether it was for a minute or a day or a week or two months, just to give people that hope and the positivity that some of us were lacking is what I would say. Because during this time, it was hard. We were feeling many different emotions. But I, I say that because I often know from just talking to people or from my own past journey, it's often hard for people to sit with their own emotions. And I say we're Houdinis of sitting through our emotions because we are so good at pushing them away and not wanting to sit with them because they're very real, they're very raw. Sometimes they are don't bring up positive, they bring up maybe negative past experiences. But the self-awareness truly ties to what is going on in our society right now with the whole equity and the fight for anti-racism, because what are your thoughts, whether unconscious or conscious, on a person's racial, class, and gendered identities? So until we could examine our own beliefs and our own biases, it's going to be really hard for us to go into a classroom and to teach kids how to be anti-racist or to have a conversation with the staff that you work with about, we have to change some of the practices that we have put in place for years that we now realize probably weren't serving all children in many different facets if we're looking at the more holistic whole child approach. The second is your self-management. Now with the self-management, it comes down to how are you managing and regulating your own emotions, your own thoughts, your behaviors, and effectively in different situations? I don't know how you feel, Evelyn, but I could tell you from past experiences, and I think we're more tough on ourselves, I am the worst critic sometimes of myself. And the judgments and the thoughts that I have in my own head, if I would never let anybody speak to me like that, but yet I speak to myself like that, which is awful. But if you can't even be aware that that's how you're talking to yourself, then I question of how are you going to manage it, manage that? And how do you manage other kids then when you see that they're dysregulated to help them control their own emotions and to help give them strategies when they're feeling stressed or when they have anxiety, or maybe when they're showing depression in order to help motivate them to achieve their own personal and academic goals. Absolutely. And I think a very important thing for us to remember and think about when it comes to this subject is from zero to five, we play such an important role in how children see themselves, their self-talk, as you're saying. And if you really think about like an adolescent's brain and the way they can really just, they talk to themselves and how their self-esteem can just really plummet during those years, this is where we can really make a different, a huge difference. And a lot of people do not take into account the fact that what a child is going through at four mm -hmm. will actually start showing up when they hit like seventh grade through their high school years. And it, it's really fascinating. I know when um, I was in college, I, uh, I can't remember which class it was, but we did a study on teenage cutting Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me that usually stuff that happened when they were about three and four is what ends up causing a teen to be a cutter by the time they're like anywhere between 12 and 16. So the work we do in this is so very important because we really are laying that foundation. So awareness for us is huge. 
I think the other things that I want to add, and I, I often tell parents this, especially my friends, when we're going through the pandemic, the reality is, is if you as a parent or a teacher, right? If you're at the daycare and you're a teacher or in a business and you're a leader, how you show up, people could feel your energy. So if I'm showing up anxiety ridden, or if I'm showing up fearful, if you think that a child who is one, two, or a 50 year old can't then feel and sense how you're showing up and isn't gonna feed off of that, I, I'm here to tell you that's, that's not accurate. People can feel exactly how you are. They might not be able to express it, especially a child at the young age at the daycare center, but that is the importance of why I wanna help everybody to help these kids teach right? We, we're teaching math, we're teaching science, we're teaching English, we're teaching how to write your name and your numbers, then why are we not teaching the kid the most important essential piece of their life? And that's knowing who they are and how to build relationships and how to, to control their emotions in a positive manner so that they could be personally and academically thriving, I guess is what I'm going to say. The other thing I'm going to add is, um, Kids right now may feel afraid, but they just might know, not know how to express it. And that's even more scary to me because have you checked in with your kids? Have you checked in with your kids at the center? Have you checked in with your families to say, how are you doing? And it's not, we, we go by life of how are you doing? And then the answer often is what? Good. And then we keep going our ways. I'm here to say, we have to put the human back in it and ask, how are you truly doing? Because whether we wanna see it and believe it or not, how Evelyn's doing truly affects how I'm doing too. And that's like the kids at the center. However, that one kid is doing is essentially going to have an effect on you and it's gonna have effect on the parents and it's gonna have effect on the other kids. And that's why I put the example of the collective agency is so important because at the end of the day, we are all in this together. And how can we make things a better place for all? Right. I think another really important thing to note that a lot of early childhood professionals don't really realize is if you think of as from an employer or a leader's perspective, the skills that we're looking for within our staff really actually form in those first five years of life. So this is a huge piece where we really need to focus on that social emotional literacy because it, it really will determine how a successful child is through school, how they will hold a job, how they interact with others, that cooperation, teamwork, so much of this happens. It just goes throughout their entire life and it really is what we as employers look for when it comes to a good employee. Now, that's a beautiful segue, Evelyn, and you probably didn't even know it. Um, <laughs> thank you. It's a beautiful segue because the next competency is social awareness. And what social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of, and I'm going to emphasize that, the perspective of and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures to understand social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school and community resources and support. And I think during this time of the pandemic and the racial unrest, what people are asking and me included is we just want you to hear, right? There's many different lenses in which to look at the world and your families are coming with many different lenses and your children are coming with many different lenses, but we can't discount and pretend that the lens in which people have been taught is the standard norm is what I'm going to say is white middle-class America. And while that is the norm for a lot of people, that's not the norm for everybody. So having that understanding is going to be key, especially because when we're talking about the examples of belonging or co-ownership and the knowledge of diverse social norms, these social norms are what Evelyn was talking about, because at the end of the day, we're teaching our kids a lot of unwritten ways to behave and to act right now in these years. They're watching you, they're soaking it in, and then you're even saying it to a lot of them. 
So then how are all those norms then going to show up later? For example, I think about one norm that was normal to us that I will say moving forward and you, you know, let me know if you agree on this, Evelyn, is shaking hands. Shaking hands was so normal once you got into society and looking at the person in their eyes and with COVID right now and the social distancing and just moving forward and forever, I don't know if shaking hands will ever become normal again, but that was the social norm. Absolutely. You know, and I totally agree. And sometimes I have to wonder if some of the changes are a good thing, right? Because as shaking hands before we really were passing germs along also, and for being in their childhood and, you know, you work with children too, we tend to be a little bit more aware of those germs that are going around. So that's one of the things I'm kind of glad maybe going away, you know, a good fist bump is so much more hygienic. Or here's the other thing I think about it. Get creative, right? Hey, air hug it or air high five or elbows. There's so many things that you can do. A smile goes a long way. So it's those simple things that I would, I want to help people understand. The other thing I think is a social norm that we've conditioned kids to do, but we have to also understand every culture that they bring is, well, you need to look at me in my eyes when I'm talking to you. But the reality is in some cultures, that's extremely disrespectful and they're taught not to look at people in their eyes, but yet that's the norm. So I'm just wanting everybody to open up their eyes and view of, okay, we need to be socially aware, but we need to be socially aware of all cultures and all races and all families, because every family doesn't bring the same to the table that you as an educator in the daycare field may be teaching to the kids relationships. Um, (laughs) I'm laughing because I want you guys just to take a moment to think about before I even say what this definition is to give you a better understanding, how are your relationships right now? A lot of us were forced to possibly stay in the house for months on end with our husband or our spouse or our children or yourself. So I guess the question that I would ask everybody to reflect on is how did that go truly, right? I don't want anybody to sit here and pretend, give me a pretend answer. And you don't even have to say it. If you want to put it in the chat, if you want to give yourself a not so great or awesome, you, when you're forced to live with somebody for days upon end, you see a different part of that person. And I guess the thing that I kept in my mind the whole time during COVID was When my kids look back on this, because I have two, um, when they look back on this, how are they going to view me? How are they going to view that mommy acted to them? Is it mommy fell apart and she was all in her feelings and her emotions and her anxieties and her fears showed up? Or is it, you know what? I'm proud of mommy because mommy taught me a lot during that time. Mommy taught me there's so many things that I could do to be independent for myself. Mommy taught me that I could only control certain things and the rest I need to let go. Mommy taught me to be grateful and have gratitude and be appreciative for different situations. So I'm going to, again, question you to say, did you make relationships better or did you tear relationships up completely because you didn't know yourself and you weren't aware of possible fears or doubts or judgments that you personally had? So the relationship skills definition, I want to read it so that it could soak in is the ability to establish and maintain healthy is the key word and rewarding relationships with another key word, diverse individuals and groups. This includes communicating clearly, listening actively, which was oh so very hard sometimes with my husband during this time, cooperating, resisting inappropriate social pressures, negotiating conflict constructively and seeking and offering help when needed. And that's the other thing I want to say. I was built upon, I don't need help, right? I've kind of, and and we see that and we hear that, right? Often a lot of times the, it's the female or even the minority female that comes off as I don't need anybody's help, but thank you. And this was truly a time that I said, okay, future, you have to sit with yourself, right? I have to go back to my own self-awareness and I'm locked in my house for two months with my kids while in addition, my husband's an essential worker and has to go to work, but I'm also working full-time. So there's gonna need 
need to be times that I need to put my hand out there and say to somebody, I need your help. Whether it's, can you watch my kids, please? Or can they come over there for an hour? Or can you pick me up something when you're going to the grocery store? Or can I just talk to you because I'm going to melt down myself? So did you show that vulnerableness and have courageous conversations with people to say, I'm in real deep here. And in order for me to say mentally and physically healthy, I need help. So I guess that's what I'm questioning um, everybody just to think on because it's, it's really hard. It's hard to often collaborate in the most positive manner, but then also have the cultural competency. I think there's a lot of people that are being forced right now during this time to hear diverse individuals, opinions and points of views. But I'm hoping that people could be self-aware to get to the point where they're able to have courageous conversations with people because you have to be vulnerable in the courageous conversations that I truly believe that we need to have in regards to dismantling some of these systems that we've have in place in regards to daycare, in regards to education, businesses, that this will eye open and change things. The last competency is responsible decision making. And the responsible decision making is the ability to make constructive and respectful choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on consideration of ethical standards, safety concerns, social norms, realistic evaluations of confident consequences and various actions and the well being of self and others. So I go back to again being locked in your house right um, or not what responsible decision makings were you making for the collective well-being of everybody? Because at the end of the day, we see people, right? I'm not pointing people out, but it was all over the news. Florida and beaches, right? When everything hit, there were still hundreds of people on the beach. So I guess the question that I ask is, was that the most responsible decision made by those people? People, when this first hit, walking into places, choosing without masks, is that the most responsible decision for the collective well-being of everybody? The other thing I'm going to ask is you probably as daycare center owners made decisions possibly that weren't the most responsible decisions because of financial fear for the kids and the families. I mean, that, that ha is probably the reality and it's maybe a tough to hear but I wanna push on people of what decisions were you making that you know in your heart were impacting a great many amount of people, but because of whatever reasons you put in your head and believe that it was okay, maybe weren't the best for the well being. And I'm talking about the physical, the psychological, and the emotional well being of the people that you either want service or the people that you love and care about. Um, okay, let me go to the SEL equity and social justice, because that's what Evelyn brought up in the beginning. At the end of the day, um, my belief is, and I stand here in this whole meeting speaking for my own self, right? I'm not coming on here as the director of the social and emotional learning and community outreach person for my school district. These are my own beliefs and my own thoughts. At the end of the day, I truly believe we have a chance to get it right. And I, I think COVID, unfortunately, and I have people that I don't personally know, but my friend's family member passed away from COVID. And I know numerous people that have had COVID. So COVID has deeply touched my life too. And many people have passed away from COVID. But at the end of the day, COVID, I always come with my gratefulness and I do a gratitude journal every night. I write at least five things down because it's part of my practice as a human being. And I'm blessed to have had COVID in my life. And I'm gonna tell you the why. The why is COVID exposed many inequities in our systems, whether it was healthcare, whether it was education, whether it was us just as people with our work ethic that I'm hoping we can sit here and say, you know what, we have a chance to get it right. And there's laws and policies that we each are subjected to or choose to put in place. But we can emerge out of our own consciousness to say we could do this right and we could do this better. And we are all part of that leadership can, that can make these changes. So at the end of the day, we have to remember that kids don't care how much you know. They don't. Because if 
a person was to pass away or when they see you later on, they're never going to say to you, wow, you taught me my ABC is so great. Or you helped me understand that history piece of time from 1870 to 1900. They're never going to say that. They're always going to come back to the emotions and that self-awareness and the self-management and the responsible decisions that you help them make or the positive relationships that they form. That's what they care about. They don't care how much you know until they know deep down inside that you actually care about them. The other thing that I want to point out is um, equity and SEL and social justice is all together. It is. It's issues on well being and social emotional learning is essentially rooted in social justice. It's rooted in social justice because I've had deep conversations with Ellen for many out, Evelyn for many hours. And at the end of the day, if you don't know yourself internally, where your biases or your implicit or explicit biases or what you're consciously thinking, or, oh my God, I'm crossing the street when I see a certain person, or I'm grabbing my purse. If you don't know how you're showing up on any given day, whether it's in the classroom or outside in your normal life, you can't come to the table and have a courageous conversation to change policies or to talk to your employees or to talk to your families or to help your students on their path to social and emotional learning. Because social emotional learning starts with you as a person first and it's not gonna be easy, all right? I'm, I'm sitting here telling you it wasn't easy for me. I had to sit with my trauma. I had to sit with just not nice occurrences, right? But those beautiful unwanted occurrences got to me to the place where I am today and I'm on a mission, literally, I'm on a mission then to help everybody get this into daycares and implement it and weave it in every piece of their being. Because I know, I know the psychology behind children. And I know that the key years are zero to eight. It's, it forms many monumental foundational pieces for those kids. And I don't want to be a dream killer. I want to have the kids knowing who they are so that they're proud of themselves and they're proud of their own being. But we need to tear down a system that we thought was great and build it up again to have the student's voice, to have collective agencies, to center more on the race and equity, to learn and reflect, to take actions um, and to leverage that collective power that we each have as people, as an institution and as an individual journey to make things better. So I think that's overall the wrap up, you know, of the competencies and where we're at right now. I think the key concepts of a flash recap are um, advance a world built on belonging. We need, we need to build bridges. We do. How close are you with your students? How close are you with your families? Do you truly know them? And there's so many beautiful gifts that they can provide you and your students at your daycares but have you asked them to provide that is my question. And I know that social emotional learning is the how of bridging those gaps and building them. And to make things come alive, we need to breathe them in. So the question that I would ask you is what kind of an ancestor am I willing to be? What, what do I want my legacy to be for myself and for my family? And the legacy I want to leave behind is I tried everything within my power to get to the core and the root causes of what is going on and to help people embed this early on so that we could have a beautiful world for my children and for my grandchildren and for all. So I guess the question with, that I would ask you, Evelyn, is what resonates, what resonates with you? I think it's awareness and really being conscious. I think a lot of us assume that we're doing our part, but we aren't really diving into ourselves. We aren't really looking, like you were saying earlier, for those um, unknown biases, really. And I had shared shared with you earlier that um, for me, I think it was something big that happened was um, I opened my eyes to my staff basically and how am I protecting them? How am I really being conscious and helping them? I have a very diverse staff 
And I, when uh, the occurrence of George Floyd happened, there was a few of them who had come to me and they were nervous. And I told you, you know, it didn't really, I didn't think about it because they weren't African-American. And so I just assumed, oh, it's okay. And, you know, for me, um, my mom is an immigrant from Honduras. And so I think a lot of time because of that, I just, don't I don't really think of how like it's affecting other people because since I was raised by a minority I've been through that I just kind of think like, oh I know what it's like then I just kind of play it off because I've lived the life and but during that time I really re had to re reevaluate and just ask myself how is my company protecting people of other races how is my company making this a good place to work for other people? And also with the children in our care, how are we serving them? How are we you know, making sure that this is a truly inclusive place, not somewhere that I just say is, but how is it truly helping these other cultures? Am I embracing them? Do they feel welcome here? Are we keeping them safe here? Are there, do I have policies in place that really keep them safe? Mm -hmm. And that's something I think that a lot of us don't even think about. Like I didn't have any policies before this and I just kind of assumed, well, it's who I am. Therefore it's how my business is going to be. Right. But mm -hmm. then I just kind of realized like, no, that's not enough. I, especially as I start stepping out of my center, I need to make sure that those parts of me stay there, which is where they need to come into policy. And so I think that's the biggest thing. There's just self-awareness and really diving deep within yourself, which like you said, isn't an easy journey and it doesn't happen overnight. Years. This has been years in the making, right? Um, literally yoga. I will say yoga saved my life, right? I, I practice yoga. And when people think of yoga, they are actually talking about the sauna practice, which is the physical practice. So I practice that. Um, I practice meditation. I practice breathing techniques. All those things I've inserted into my life as a being and then with my children. I think the other thing that I want to remind people, um, just because obviously everybody's journey is different, right? But I could speak of my journey as a minority, biracial. And I grew up in a predominantly white area. And when I say predominantly white area, I was the only person who was a minority, not even a black person or a biracial person, only minority in my graduating class at high school. Okay. So that gives you a perspective. Um, and you could have that one child at your daycare center, right? Or you may have no children that are considered a minority or people of color. But then it's even more of a duty that you need to implement social emotional learning, especially with an equity lens to help them then understand. Because at the end of the day, I will argue with anybody, racism is taught. And it's not good enough because, um, and I did a video on this with somebody, it's not good enough because oftentimes people will say, but I'm a good person. And I'm not gonna argue that you're not a good person. What I'm going to argue and push you on is you could be a good person, but you could still be a racist. And what we're looking for right now is how are you embedding in your center anti-racism, right? So it's good to, if we have our blinders up and we just don't speak about it, that's not teaching anybody anything. So these children that we're raising right now are going to be going into society with not just staying in their little bubble that you may have them in right now because of where they live with just them, right? Or just one culture that is white middle class and pretty much predominantly straight couples. There's many different ways of life and there's beauty that comes with each of them and many things that people can learn. So obviously I've developed a lot of resources and needs assessments, right? With trying to help people because the advancement of this starts with us as adults. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's also important to like really look at that from a broad perspective. And I'll tell you a story that happened to me, um, which was kind of where I grew up uh, in like just the phase of life. So um, when my son was two years old, I was actually doing a garage sale and I had a couple Hispanic ladies pull up to the garage sale and they were buying some stuff. And um, my son came running out the front door. And the first thing the women said to me is, do your, your baby has a white daddy? 
And I said, yeah, you know, and it, I didn't even think of anything. They literally took my stuff and threw it on the floor and smashed it and spit on it and drove away. So I think that's something to really think about too, is um, my mom really just raised me to just not, I don't know, she just really protected me from both sides, right? She was very, very intentional about protecting me from both sides of the racism card there. But it really was a huge eye-opening and shocking experience that whichever side, you know, I get racism from being Hispanic, but then I'm also now experiencing it at that point in my life from a perspective of, okay, now I'm a Hispanic who married a white man and had a white child. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important for everyone just to really, really be aware, you know, and look at it from so many different levels that, um, I mean, my 16 year old still gets teased from, you know, just because he has a white dad. Mm -hmm. So very, just to really, so awareness is so broad, you know, and also when it comes to special needs, how are we helping children really just embrace, you know, the children that they're going to be in school with, like, especially for preschool, mm -hmm. if we're not having inclusive classrooms, how are these children going to react when they hit elementary school and they may see a child, you know, in a wheelchair or something. So it's important for us to think of it from a really broad perspective. And I think you bring up a good point. Um, Cause one thing that we didn't say right at the beginning, cause I obviously I'm a teacher at heart, um, but my teaching career has began with children with disabilities. That's what my first love was in the private business sector, working with children who had um, autism. And then I co-taught many years in many different classrooms. I have my master's in special education. So it is, right? It's, we have to teach kids early on. And that's the self-awareness piece. That's, there's many beauties and many different people. And we have to be accepting and respectful of all. But then how do you weave that in, right? It's a huge task. It's a huge task that we're asking people to do, right? It's, it's not easy. Um, but I think it's needed. And I'm hoping that this resonates for people and that you could sit down with yourself and even with your loved ones or maybe with some of the people at your job and have this conversation of, huh, maybe I'm 20 or 30, 40, 50. And you know what? I haven't really sat with myself. How often are we sitting with ourselves, right? There's so, we mind numb as people and it's unfortunate, but we go to social media, whether that's Facebook or your Instagram or your, for kids, Snapchats, your LinkedIn, whatever social media platform that you prefer, right? Or we go to binge watching Netflix. How many people during the pandemic said, I'm sitting home for two months and I'm going to sit with myself? No, they chose to not. They chose, to, do, most people are going to choose to do everything that said, I'm not going to sit with myself. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, right? I, I think if we sit with ourselves more, there's so many things that you will learn about yourself that you probably didn't even know. Right, I so agree, yes. And that's where journaling I think is a great, like you were saying, just having yes. intentional time to yourself and journal, do what you need to do. I think that is a very, very important. Do you have any suggestions on prompts people can use to start journaling? Okay, so you could start journaling of basic, right? We want to bring in an attitude of gratitude or an attitude of giving. It's been proven there's the happiness studies, right? And the science of well being. And it's been proven through research that the things that most people think will make them happy aren't actually the things that will make them happy. They don't realize how much they will feel joy and happiness if they give to people they don't realize how much joy it will bring them to just sit down and bathe in the gratitude for the day. So my writing journal prompts that I would suggest to people would be something as simple as, I am grateful for. What are you grateful for that day, right? Now, and this may sound a little crazy for you, but I'm grateful for my life right now, right? We see what's going on in the news. So that I'm here and that I can have the opportunity to make a difference, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I have basic needs, right? I have a house. I have food that I can buy. I have clothes. I have clean water. It's simple things that you could just journal. You could probably easily write a hundred different things down that are basic that you didn't realize, wow, 
I can go on Amazon and just shop and get whatever I want. I don't have to wait for three weeks until I get my next check. It's those simple things that people, I would say, sometimes take for granted, unfortunately. I think that's a good journal prompt. I think another journal prompt is just sitting there in quietness to say, what's on my heart today? Oh, and yeah. Right? And yeah. I don't know what's going to come up for you. The different things are going to come up for different people, but then just whatever words, right? It doesn't have to be, we are perfectly imperfect. And I think people are striving for being perfect. Well, what is that, right? There is no such thing. There's no such thing as perfect. So sit in your beauty of your perfectly imperfect and say, what's on my heart and soul today? And at whatever comes up for you, it doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be full sentence of it. If it's bullet points that come up, then that's what you put. If you're thinking of a tree at that moment with apples or kids running outside in the wind, then that's what you're putting. But it's going to show you a story and lead you somewhere. And the question is, is what do you need to be led to? I don't know, but I know it will help you find where you need to go to. Right. Or um, what did I do kind to make somebody feel happy this week? Did you? Did you show somebody kindness this week? Did you write a kind letter? I know I've obviously been implementing a lot of different things during COVID. Um, and I said, okay, I'm going to try to write letters for people and go deliver that, that to them. We have so many people that we didn't get to where we are by ourselves, right? right. Everybody has to remember that at the end of the day. And have you thanked all those people who have helped you along your way to your greatness now? And if you didn't, then I would say maybe you should be journaling to write a thank you to those people. Thank you for my job. Thank you for showing me kindness when emotionally I was drained during a certain time, whatever it might be. Thank you to your kids. Thank you for teaching me patience, right? Have you sat down with them to say, you taught me a lot during this time, whether it was at the daycare center or was whether it's in your own home. Thank you for doing that because those little nuggets make you a better being too. Right. I agree. One of the things that I've been challenging my audience with, there's actually two things, uh, is the first one is to think of who you want to the, emerge from this crisis as, because we do have a choice. We can choose who we will emerge from this crisis as. And so that would be something too, I would challenge people just write down, who do you want to be at the end of this crisis? Who, what, how do you want to emerge from this? The second thing that I've suggested is to write a letter to yourself that you will read a year from now. And mm -hmm. just who, what do you want to accomplish? Where do you want to be? So one of the things that I do now that I um, actually got from uh, Brooke Castillo's teaching is to write yourself a thank you letter for doing the things that you wanted, that you've done in order to get through something and to be the person that you want to be. And then you read that letter a year from now. So just write yourself a letter. Thank you for doing this and being this person in order for me to achieve this. And then a year from now, read it and see how well you've done. Well, the other thing, Evelyn, that I would add is a lot of times people forget how strong they are, right? We each, now I could tell you probably stories that would make you cry, which I'm not going to do, but we each have our path, right? We each have struggles. We each have challenges that we each have overcome. And what are those? But oftentimes we forget about them. But those moments that may have been your deepest, darkest times showed you a strength that you probably didn't even know you had. And that strength is still there. And there's going to be more moments that come up that will test you as a being. Um, but I always tell people, you have to shine in your own lighthouse. You have to be a lighthouse and you have to just shine bright knowing that the people and the things that need to come to you will come to you. Right. I totally, totally agree with you. And that's um, one of the big messages that I also try to spread right now is, uh, and that's kind of how I started with this because, well, as often as I do it now, um, during the COVID crisis, I saw so many people just terrified of what was going to happen to their businesses, their jobs. And so for a while I was going live like this every single day, just trying to bring that hope back. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to know that we can choose. And this, what we're going through now 
is going to be a lot of people's stories. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the story that you can tell your children later on, the your story of perseverance. So that comes back to that, you know, just choose how is that story going to end and do the things you need to do in order to make sure you're controlling your own narrative. Mm -hmm. Because this will be in the history books, right? I mean, that's that's reality. Yep. This will be in the history books. So when you're sitting with your grandchildren, what stories do you want to have to tell them, I guess, is my question. Absolutely. Yeah. So do we have any questions that people need answered? Let me see. We do have a lot of comments. Oh. Um, so let's see. We've got, uh, this season has given me plenty of opportunity to work on relationships. There are days that I respond and interact positively in days that I fall short. Uh, in those times I fall short, it has allowed me to practice being vulnerable and asking forgiveness. That's from Rosie. That is an awesome. That is awesome, Rosie. Yes. And then Tammy um, says that the first few weeks of COVID were very hard. I realized that I don't want to retire anytime soon. <laughs> It, that's awesome. It gave me quality time with my grandson and it taught me that I need to relate, nurture more relationships. That is fantastic. Also, that's yeah. So very positive. That's pretty much the tone from the comments we're getting is just that a lot of self-awareness. Right. That's good. Right. I mean, that's what we want. We want people to look at it and say, okay, I found the beauty. They're saying they found the beauty of things I need to, things I'm rocking or things I need to improve upon, which Absolutely. is exactly what we want. Uh, now, yeah, that is wonderful. Now, well, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, future, I'm sorry. The question would be, how are you going to integrate that now into your daycare system? Mm -hmm. That's yes. the question. Absolutely. And keep it going. So when this is over, we want to make sure that we're keeping it going. Oh, we did just get another question from Annette. What policies have you put in place to combat racism? That's a great question. Okay. So um, you could do equity policies. That's what you could do. And there are some people who have to work through a board, obviously different day school districts are set up not the same as daycares are, right? So there's people who have equity policies. Um, but again, it's, you're going to have to start with self-awareness. So you're going to have to start with self-awareness because you might think, okay, I want to input these, whether you're a teacher or whether you're the daycare owner, right. Then are all the people that are the key players, the stakeholders, I'll say in alignment with you and what you want to do. Because if as a teacher, now I'm not, I think you should speak up. I was that teacher. If I saw something that wasn't right, I was constantly pushing the buttons and I didn't care if it was an administrator or not, because right is right. So if you think that it's something that you can do or that your school does, well, your daycare, I should say, your daycare needs to do, or even if you're a parent and you say, hey, we don't even have an equity policy at our school, then those are questions that you need to ask. But obviously, um, that's why I'm saying people could reach out to me and I'd be happy to work with anybody and work through that. Yes, I was actually just going to bring that up. Um, Annette is a newer owner. So, and I was actually going to bring that up. Uh, Future is actually available for hire, similar to what I do in coaching, but Future actually helps companies with, and personally, not just companies, but she'll also help you personally just really do some soul searching, find out where you may need that fine tuning when it comes to your um the diversity in your own life and then equity. So she can help with both professionally and personally. So the, her uh, contact information is here. I will also be putting it in the comments so that people who are watching the playback can get that information later. Any other comments future on that? Any And any other questions, guys? We have a couple more minutes, probably about two more minutes. So if you want to, anyone else wants to drop a question in there. So I would say you can um, follow me on LinkedIn or follow me on Instagram. I do not post many pictures of myself and I don't post pictures of my kids because for those of you who don't know me, but now you do, I'm super private. Um, I'm a super private person, but I want to help people in the best way that I can. That's what I've been called to do for more than 20 years, right? I'm in the service of servicing others. And um, so I usually weekly at least try to post a quote on LinkedIn and then the same with Instagram. And I try to just post uplifting pictures or things that are going to make you think, um, especially in regards to the equity and the anti-racism work that we're doing right now. 
I would say if you're going to reach out to me, you'll probably get the quickest response if you try to meet me on LinkedIn, but I would put a comment. You could put a comment and just say, I'd like to learn more about social and emotional learning. And I'm going to tell you why on this. I literally have had hundreds of people within the past few weeks reach out to me because of the anti-racism work that I'm doing. So I have a lot of people that are linking to me now. So I don't want you to get lost in the shuffle if you truly want to embed this and you need help right now embedding the social emotional learning because obviously equity is my passion, but social emotional learning is my passion too. Um, it's what I live and breathe as a human being. So that's what I would say. If um, you're willing to wait, then I would say you could email the future of SEL at Gmail. But if you're looking for a quick response, I would say LinkedIn with a comment to help me sift through is the way to go. Perfect. And um, you're going to have to start a membership group like I did <laughs> in order to get through to all the people who need your work. So <laughs> awesome work that you're doing. I really do appreciate it. I'm hoping that this is something we can spread through the early childhood education world and, you know, especially in the private sector, because it's not something we hear enough about for sure. So thank you so much for doing this with me. And again, for those of you watching, we are going to be doing this every Monday for the next four weeks, right? It's like, yeah. yep. So the next four weeks, same time, and we are recording. So I will also be posting the recordings on my YouTube channel, which I will be sharing with you guys. I'm just getting that going now. And this, these videos will all be um, I'll start a units tab within our Facebook group and um, for all of the videos and resources that we put out for this series. So I hope everybody has a wonderful day and thank you again so much future for joining us. I always tell people stay healthy, be mindful and stay positive during this mental marathon. Thank you. Thank you.